director for it. Mm -hmm. And I had the right director, and then he had a Broadway gig at the last minute, and suddenly there I was left with it. But um, I thought that Doug not only thinks as a writer and, well, he also thinks like a director. He has a big vision. And I wanted to see him play with that mm -hmm. in a very unpressured situation, which was our um, festival, uh, on a, which was a, what, at that point 99 seats, yeah. I think, on our main stage. We just cleared everything off and put 99 chairs down. And there he was doing the work. And it was thrilling to watch that work happen. So I, I, you know, sometimes you do things, especially when you're running a theater, it's all gut instinct. Mm -hmm. and it was our, it's just gut instinct that he would be good at this and have fun. And I don't know if this was your experience at all, but as a, a young writer who was seeing his work directed early on, I got so accustomed to those unnerving 3 a.m. phone calls from actors oh, yeah. where they say, I don't know what he wants from me. I don't know what he wants me to do. And I equally, you know, maddened on my end of the line would say, in that scene, you just want Alfred to apologize. And if Alfred will apologize, you could get on with your life. And, and yeah. so then this actor and I would show up the next day in rehearsal and mm -hmm. I'd be speaking English and he'd be speaking English and there'd be this bizarre person running the room yes. who was speaking some inscrutable East European language. And, Absolutely. and I just thought, let's cut out the middleman. Yeah. yeah. I think that's exactly right. I think I had an experience where a particular director who will remain nameless spent the first 10 days of the rehearsal of a new play of mine playing what it calls Kush Ball. They were playing, you know, they were playing theater games. And I was, wanted them to rehearse my play and I also wanted to make some changes and I was barred from the rehearsal room because of their process. He didn't want me to make the actors nervous. I thought, no, 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 I am never going to go through this again. And I find out if I don't now direct at least the premiere of a play, I don't finish the play. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the one play I'd say is not finished. The other thing, interestingly enough, is I know you know Mrs. Packard really mm -hmm. well. I didn't want to direct that play. I wanted to be able to have the ability to just be the writer on it because it was so complex directorially. Mm -hmm. And I think I have more writing work to do on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, you learn about your place by directing. Absolutely. Yeah. And like Doug, I'm not going to a middleman. I look at this, a scene isn't working. Why isn't it working? Is it the acting? Is it the staging? Or is it the writing? And I can make a difference with all three things when I'm directing it myself without the middleman. Say, oh my god, this, this speech doesn't work. <laughs> I'm not calling the playwright sobbing at three in the morning. Saying, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I can't make this work. It's just like, it doesn't work. Well, and conversely, you've adapted a great deal, and yes. I just started adapting Strindberg and directed it last year, and I discovered that there's no better preparation for directing a play That's than right. to adapt it. Exactly. Because you know every moment, you've unearthed it for yourself in the most honest way. And you've had this really intimate collaboration with a fellow writer from the grave, something that's very creepy. <laughs> well, I found out that I, I've done three of Chekhov's, right. I'm, we would have really gotten on. <laughs> <laughs> sound that there's a little bit of a warning in your in, in talking about plays directing and, and there sounds like there might be pitfalls. What would you if, if if a playwright in this audience now gets the idea from our conversation that they should now go out and direct their plays, what would you warn them about? What would you say, you know, tread carefully here? I could say something there. I mean I, I, I know because I've, I've I've had the problem. One is objectivity about the work itself. Secondly, storytelling. Are you, as a director, telling the story clearly enough because maybe you know that too well and you, you make certain presumptions mm -hmm. that an audience who's got virgin eyes will not, mm -hmm. you know, will not know? Um, also, sometimes if you care very much simply about your words, if you think your words are being heard, you think something's working. I've had this discussion with Edward, <laughs> just thinking all about this. And um, that's a bad assumption to make. Mm -hmm. So my suggestion is if you're going to direct your own play, especially in its premiere, you need to have tough critics from the inside telling you what you've got. Someone's coming to your first run through and your second, and 
your third, and, and through every proof you tell you what works and doesn't work in their opinion. Mm -hmm. And you take those opinions very seriously. Did you work with like an assistant director or someone who's kind of your dramaturg person with you? Well, I, I've been very lucky on that. Yes, I've had good assistants. I've also had, I know this is probably a very big discussion at some point. I've, I've actually worked with two great dramaturgs in my mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. um, and I know they're rare. Right, right. Well, it's, it's, mm -hmm. I, it's something that would, they would be crucial in this situation to have that objectivity. Yeah. Did, have you also worked with a dramaturg? Or? Yeah, I would say, I guess the first thing, I think, I think the reason playwrights are so routinely not allowed to direct their work is the expectation that because they know the text and because the play has fully flowered for them in the writing process, they'll be too prescriptive, too early in rehearsal. They'll want to see results. They'll want to see actors get it right away. So what I always counsel with writers directing their work is patience, because you learn over time that a discovery an actor makes for him or herself in a rehearsal hall, they can claim every night as their own and hit beautifully and build a performance atop it. Something you've told them to do because it serves your play becomes a moving target that they have to try and hit. And some nights they might and other nights they might not. But by pushing them too early toward a result, whether it be an actor or a designer, uh, by short-circuiting the process of your collaborators to achieve the perceived end result of your play, you can end up sabotaging everyone's process but your own. So I think a lot of writers need patience to let their collaborators fully indulge in their own process when their work is at stake. And I think that's a great definition of a good director, mm -hmm. a writer or not. Uh, well, what it makes an actor a good both not only directed their own work, but directed mm -hmm. other playwrights' work. Would you say, perhaps, try working with another playwright's work that you can be objective with first before you try to direct your own work, just to do, develop your directing chops? Or did that not work for you? Did you actually start off directing your own work in directing? I started out directing my own work, but I was already a director. You were a director. Yeah. I, I was a professional director yeah. when I was doing that. So So you had learned your chops, and so yeah, it might make sense. getting better, one hopes. But, um, yeah. I, we're, we're talking. I mean, the, the fact is, and the audience may not know this, is that Edward Albee, because even though he's not here, he's here, um, did direct a great deal. Uh, and in fact, if you're interested, uh, Rakesh Solomon has come out with a volume on Albee in performance, him directing, and I think also other directors directing, including some, you know, historic productions that Edward directed. Um, and you can really, it's really fascinating because he talks about the fact he doesn't change his work, he doesn't change his work, but in fact. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Right. Well, it's, 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 it's out there. It's published. Oh, it is. Okay. And, yeah. Now yeah. he totally changes his work. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and exactly for the reasons that you actually talked about it, that it doesn't fit in the actor's mouth. It, it, you know, it's, it's taking too long. It's, it's explaining too much where it doesn't need to. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, for those of you who just are, are curious about that, because I think Edward has also gotten beaten up for directing his own work, but he actually worked really hard on his directing, I think uh, uh, mostly so that he could uh, develop his own plays, you know, to help him write, write his plays. Um, and uh, I think one of the other things that, that raises is, as a director and, and, a, and as a playwright, um, do you then have an opportunity to polish it for other directors later so that you're, that you're, what you're trying to do is, is give them a sense of this is what it should be. You know, do you think about that? I mean, have you thought about that as a, when you're directing your work that can, I, I'd like for other directors to see how I direct my play because this is in some ways my, my vision, even if they choose not to do it that way. Yes. But I'm always interested to see another director's take on a work of mine. I actually think a play of mine called Still Life, um, which did wonderfully in New York and around the country, it was in Paris where I saw a French production of it that was a completely different from how I directed it um, that I found most thrilling. I would never have thought of doing it the way he did, and I thought maybe he did it better. And I loved learning that. That's it, that's and it was, means the play was strong. I do think it, it, I always 
look at plays as being less analogous to novels or poetry and more like a list of instructions that come with a vacuum. And it's like, <laughs> if, if you take out the list of instructions and you're you know, a director anywhere in the country and you take this character and that character and you put them in a living room and they say this to each other, when you're done, uh, you'll get the play. And so the instructions have to be rigorous and careful and consistent and clear and, and, and stand up to the brightest minds and the grossest dullards. And I will say that, you know, if I've written and sent a vacuum out into the world and I go to Des Moines to see it, I kind of want to see a vacuum. Uh, but if I haven't, oftentimes it's because of uh, weaknesses in, in the text or the instructions that I've sent. And I think by directing, you're testing those instructions all the time. Yeah. Certainly, as, as Emily says, I've, I've seen productions of my work that were revelatory because they did depart from my mandates or expectations, and that's been thrilling. But I think it's more common to, to see work that sometimes misses the mark, and then you have to evaluate if it's the fault of the production or the fault of the instructions that you sent. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, I mean, we were also talking about another synchronicity between the two of you, which is the fact that you both write about history, that you write about people's lives who actually have lived. And, and I mentioned this, that you both have worked differently, and of course you work differently in every single play, but in, in Mrs. Packard, it's a very different way of writing than your, your like still life or the other plays that are really documentary. And with, with um, I Am My Own Wife, it's very, very different from Quills. And the difference is fiction. The difference is what you've created in some uh -huh. ways, what you've had to create as a dramatist. And I thought it'd be interesting to kind of have you talk and maybe compare your processes and, and dealing with those issues uh, with these very, very different plays that you've written uh, that deal with history. Well, I would say immediately that, uh, again, I have to credit Emily because her beautiful play, Execution of Justice, was profoundly impactful on me when I saw it. And then in working on I Am My Own Wife, I suddenly found myself with a stack of documentary material, transcriptions, absolutely. And, and uh, the, the commitment that I would turn those transcriptions into drama. Now, if I'm correct in remembering, Emily, execution of justice is really fidelitous to the original transcripts. Yes. With wife, uh, I took more liberties and I, I compressed events and I changed the names of characters and sometimes uh, uh, worked to clarify action. So I wasn't as scrupulous as you were. But I think it was that play that influenced Moises Kaufman with the Laramie Project that in turn led to my play, I Am My Own Wife. So I think there's a real lineage there right back to, to that work. I think that's, yeah. I didn't realize that that, I knew it had uh, affected Moises, I didn't know it had affected you. Yeah, it oh, created wow. a kind of documentary theater that yeah. both he and I have, have been practicing for a while, and I think it's due to that play. Oh, I'm very moved to hear that. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. So what was the difference for you, working on Mrs. Packard and working on a play like Execution of Justice or Still Life? Well, um, each play has asked for something different. Um, the first play I wrote was a monologue um, of a, a woman I had met um, who was a, a survivor um, of World War II as a Jew and um, just sat in her kitchen while she was making chicken soup and she gave me this incredible story. Um, and then intercut myself with that. But um, still life asked for something else. I met these three people, but somehow making monologues out of them didn't work. And, and I remember someone, sa someone saying to me, why have you ordered these monologues one after the other after the other? And that first, I, I answered by saying, don't you see how this connects to this, and that connects to that, and this connects to this? And he said, well, why don't you put those connections closer together? Mm -hmm. And then I don't think I slept for a week. I, all I did was, was, was get all of the resonances going as if I were making music and the whole thing became its own creature. Mm. And that was a, a you know, kind of new form that I hadn't seen before. Um, Execution of Justice was, I thought that the story was probably embedded in those transcripts. I got that telling of the story through the transcripts. And when you only kept it like that, I had a reading of it mm -hmm. and I forgot La Mama. And it was a reactionary play. It was an apology for 
the killer of Harvey Milk and Mayor Moscone. So I thought, hmm, what's missing? And I realized that there was there were uncalled witnesses at the trial. There were people who weren't heard from. So you didn't get the whole story. So I then had the chorus of uncalled witnesses, and I went to San Francisco, and I interviewed everybody I could find on every side of the issue, um, and intercut that with the trial. And suddenly, when things got just too tough to bear, as, as everyone was celebrating the killer in the courtroom, these people got a chance. They, they were given voice. Mm -hmm. So I realized that I had to give voice, a voice to those voiceless people in this particular situation. And it also explained why he got such a light sentence. Mm -hmm. You didn't hear what he really had done. So every, every play has asked itself to be in a different form when it was sheer documentary. And I was always getting at, why did this happen? You know, if you, 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 the thing about dealing with, with real life and real people is you can't necessarily make the easier dramatic choice and just say, oh, well, everyone lived happily ever after when they didn't, for example. Well, why didn't they? You have to find it. If you can't find it, you keep digging. So that was always a great rigor, rigorous exercise for me that I found extremely exciting. But with Mrs. Packard, because I couldn't meet her, I only knew what happened to her. This is a story about a, a minister's wife in the 1860s who was married to a very, very conservative Calvinist minister just when she was discovering um, uh, uh, liberal theology and, and all kinds of new ideas. And she kept talking about it in public. And her husband said to her, if you don't shut up, I'm going to have to have you shut up. And she said, you can't shut me up. And he said, yes, I can. And he um, was totally within his rights to throw her into a lunatic asylum, which he did. For me, that was a fascinating story, and I couldn't stay away from it. Um, so I read everything she wrote, and I did the usual research you would do on a historical project. Um, and then I decided to let all of that go. And it was Edward Albee. I, I was asking him, I said, when do you know it's time to sit down to write? And he said, usually, I'm walking along the beach in Montauk, <laughs> and the people, the characters in my play won't stop talking to each other. And in order to shut them up, I sit down and I write, and it comes out in a flood. And I thought, oh, that's really good advice. And I happened to be walking on a beach um, in the Caribbean, actually, which was very nice. And <laughs> the characters started talking to each other. And I got the first scene, and then the second scene, and then I said, I better, I better sit down and write before this gets away from me, and it poured out in about three weeks. Mm -hmm. That's a different feeling than, I always liken it to, with sculpture, you know, is it Rodin was said, or Michelangelo, did you look at Michelangelo? Was Michelangelo, you know, that you're looking for the form inside and letting it emerge. Well, that's how I feel when I'm doing strict documentary. You've got a transcript this big, and you end up with a much smaller, uh, uh, set of papers. Um, and when you're writing a play like that, you're discovering it and the pages grow. Mm -hmm. um, but I discovered the play as I wrote it. People started walking into the room and other characters emerged and had that wonderful excitement of following my nose on that, whereas it's a different process doing a documentary play. Do you, do you have in mind a structure that you're going to build around as you choose material for your documentary work? I mean, do you kind of say, well, I'm going to use a trial structure, or I'm going to use, does that help you make that? That, to me, is terrifying, the idea of having that stack of papers. Right. And sometimes I know, and sometimes I don't. I came up with the idea for having our say. This is two African-American sisters, both over 100 years old. Um, I thought, wouldn't it be fun, because I'd already done this with the first Piece, to have them cooking. And then I remembered they told me that they made their father's favorite meal every year on his birthday to celebrate their father's birthday. Mm -hmm. And I got the idea because I realized that the first of uh, the dress rehearsal when we, when we did it at, 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 for the premiere would take place on their father's birthday. Mm -hmm. 
So I thought, wouldn't that be cool to just do that? And suddenly that gave me the idea of when we first met, they were very, very formal and just sat, you know, in chairs in their living room and, and had an interview. The next time we got along so well, they invited me to the kitchen. Oh. <laughs> and then the final time, they said, oh, we hope someday you'll come to our <laughs> feast. So it sort of, they gave me the, you know, the structure. Wow. Yeah. I um, never know. What, what, how did you find Quills? How did you find the Marquis de Sade? We talked a little bit, I think, earlier today about unlikable characters. And, yes. You know, and, and <laughs> yes, of course, right. <laughs> so, so how did you find this uh, interesting character? I was in a love relationship with a psychiatrist, not my own. And <laughs> <laughs> it was Christmas, and he gave me a biography of Saad. And I think I knew that what we would do. <laughs> uh, but I started to read this biography, and I got obsessed by it. And uh, uh, there was uh, a fascinating passage where uh, the Marquis de Sade uh, abandoned his wife, kidnapped his sister-in-law under an assumed name, took her to Italy, ruined her for marriage, as they used to say, and left her in a convent, and then sought an audience with the Pope. <laughs> and I thought, the Marquis de Sade and the Pope, that's a play. Because yeah. I thought, you could take those two fellas and show that maybe they had a lot more in common than they ever believed. <laughs> You'd be up to something. Uh, but I, so I started to write what was a conversation between Sade and the Pope, and uh, it was a dialectic, and it was full of all kinds of florid debate, but it lacked drama. And I continued to read the biography and came across another passage that said, while well, interred at the Sheringen Asylum, uh, the Marquis de Sade had been placed there in hopes of inhibiting his pornographic writing, but surrounded by lunatics all day, he was more inspired than ever. <laughs> and so he wrote 120 Days of Sodom on a rolled piece of parchment that was hundreds of feet long that he hid in the walls of his cell. Oh. So to get him to stop, they confiscated his quills. And I thought that act, the confiscation of his quills, mm. the, the, the lone instrument that was preserving him from madness, I thought, what would the consequences of that be? And suddenly I had a dramatic action that set the play in a kind of irrevocable, mo irrevocable motion. So yeah. it's just a reminder that no matter how high-minded your interest or thematic intent, <laughs> you ain't got a problem if you don't have a play. And uh, the confiscation of his quills became the problem. I, and I, we have to give some time for people to ask some questions. I have one last little question for you, director playwrights, which is, it's my own kind of weakness, which is talking to designers and talking about design, and I, I assume that you both do this. How do you do this? How do you, and how, and generally, I, I, Edward, I know, works with designers and talks to them, yeah. but that's not the norm for playwrights. We don't normally, they, they do it through the director, I think. Um, how do you deal with this? Because I'm fascinated by design and, and, and how players work with design. Well, Emily's done it far more than I. I would simply say that as a playwright, and I would say this to you guys too, you should be in that room. Yeah. It's your play. Right. This person is creating the vessel that's going to carry your soul. You might as well have a word about it. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I say the first thing to do is talk to the director, and if they have a problem with you being in the room, you, maybe that's not your director. Yeah, okay. that's right. Uh, I absolutely agree. And I cannot tell you how many times I've seen the wrong set really destroy a play, mm -hmm. whether it's the world premiere or, you know, the, the 20th
too. It's about what was created. It's about the play. It's not about them. It's not about you. It's about honoring the work you made and make sure that it can not be a stillborn birth. And one way to, to kill the baby is to have it encased uh, in, in the wrong envelope. And I, I think you can and must have that discussion early on with the director. You have the right to do it, and you should exercise that right. Uh, one more question. Is there another one? Yeah. Have you abandoned a play, and what prompted you to do so? I just abandoned one last <laughs> week. <laughs> I hope it's temporary, but I don't think it is. <laughs> I haven't. There's some that I that didn't receive subsequent productions, and I'm fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> there are ones that we learn on, and, and there's no shame in that. Right. An another question? Another? Do we have other? Yeah. I have a it's for Emily, man. <laughs> I did not see your production of The Cherry Orchard, but it's a play I absolutely love. And I wanted to ask about uh, your adapting it and mm -hmm. why, or that process, and if you could just talk about it a little bit. Sure. You felt like it. Sure. Okay. Um, well, I, I love Cherry Orchard. But it's interesting with me, with Chekhov, I, I've done all four of the sort of great plays, but very out of order. And I found that it was at each point of my life, one of the plays suddenly makes sense to me. For example, I, the last one I did was Seagull, and I realized it was because I finally could forgive or understand the adults in the play mm -hmm. and always ended it through the children. And I don't think our cousin is, is a monster. Um, she's selfish and there's all the kinds of things, but she, we know her, in fact. If anyone who works in the theater knows that. <laughs> 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 so once I knew that, I, I could do it. With, with Cherry Orchard, it was, I was in South Africa um, where I was doing two things. One, my play Having Our Say was being done at the, at the Market Theatere, but also I was doing the stage, um, this, this writing a movie um, on Winnie Mandela before she had been disgraced. Um, and while I was there, John Connie, the, the, um, the art, uh, has become artistic director of the market and a great, great black South African actor, said he'd always wanted to do the cherry orchard. And I thought, oh, oh, okay, why? And then I realized he looked at me like I was nuts. And he said, well, you know, serfs in Russia were not like serfs anywhere else in Europe. They were property, they were owned. And the light bulb went off. And I went back to the play, because I always thought it would be a play that was really too hard for Americans to understand. And it's crystal clear once you know that. So I was immersing myself in the play and with uh, working with the Russian translator to get the, the literal. And I picked up Souls of Black Folk, um, W.B. Du Bois's extraordinary book. And it was about the sorrow songs. I read the chapter on the sorrow songs. And suddenly the language of the sorrow songs became part of how I interpreted how to bring his gorgeous play to life um, in an American context. I kept it in Russia. I mean, it was in a theater. Um, and in a period. Um, but Avery Brooks played Lopakhin. Um, and Roger Robinson played um, Fierce. And Caroline Clay played Varia so that there were the plantation owners who had the adopted child, and the adopted child is black, so someone in the family, you know. And so, and then Cornell West came to see it and said, oh my God, I've always thought that the play was about this. <laughs> and so I cannot take any credit for it, because um, I got it from John, but when you do it, it's just revelatory. I forgot your question. <laughs> Oh, okay. okay. We, we, we must stop there. We, we are out of time. Thank you all, and thank you so much. For